have for the Mutual Professor Series, we have Dr. Alan Nolan, who was born in San Diego, California, but he was raised in rural North Mississippi. Dr. Nolan grew up in small town Mississippi. He graduated from high school in 2002 with 71 classmates from Moorville High School, right outside of Tupelo, Tupelo. <laughs> the birthplace of Elvis Presley. Dr. Nolan initially started a college to start a college to become a veterinarian, even serving as a vet tech to a local exotic animals veterinarian for a couple of years, before then changing his major to education. Dr. Nolan then graduated from Ole Miss and began teaching seventh grade science in Central Mississippi in 2007. Dr. Nolan would teach K-12 science for seven years, eventually getting his master's degree in geosciences while still teaching. In 2014, Dr. Nolan quit K-12 to pursue a PhD at the University of Southern Mississippi, where he served as an assistant state director of Mississippi Science Olympia. Upon completing his PhD in science education, Dr. Nolan was hired at Otero College in 2018 and has been here ever since and serves as the department chair of math and sciences. Everyone today, please help me welcome Dr. Alan Nolan. Thank you, thank you. I want to remind everyone that we have the drinks and some chips and stuff. If you're here and you're a student, make sure to sign in so we have a record of who's attending here. Um, oh, screensaver, that's bad. No more screensaver. Okay, so thank you for coming. Um, I like to think that I'm one of those conundrums wrapped in enigma, surrounded by mystery. We'll see if that actually happens today or not. Uh, but yes, I am Dr. Alan Nolan. Um, and I had a question already, I wanted to kind of throw it out. My little uh, Latin up there is the, it's an old wives' tale, but it's kind of the epitome of how I want to kind of live my life. So it translates to, and yet it moves. And when Galileo was, well, he was put under house arrest for all of his beliefs that the Earth moved around the sun, and basically the time, at the time, he was put under house arrest, couldn't leave his house, and he died on his deathbed, and the old wives tell us that that's what he said as he was dying. So he literally went to his grave with his, you know, his belief that the earth moved around the sun. That's, that's what the evidence for uh, suggested. And that's kind of how I want to theme this today is that, and I'm a science person. I think that's gonna be clear from pretty early on. I'm a science person and that's where things lead. I go by the evidence and I, I don't just do things all willy nilly, but we're gonna see that as we go, but it didn't always start that way. So that was a beep, where did that go? That is still beeping. So a lot of beeps there. Okay, so obviously I didn't start off in La Junta, and um, as Cedric mentioned, I was born in San Diego, but that is because dad was a Marine. So first and foremost, I am the son, I'm a military brat. I was raised essentially over here in Okinawa. So soon after I was born, uh, Camp Pendleton, we moved over to Okinawa, and I lived there for about three years. And I still hold on to this. Again, this is one of those that contradicts myself real early. I believe that my palate for food comes from being raised here. So I like have zero tolerance for spice. I do have some Southern heritage as we'll get to, but I, I love the, the whole Asian palate, high soy, that kind of stuff. Um, and still to this day, if I have a choice of non-American food, that's probably where I'm going to go. And we'll, we'll, we'll blame my parents for that one. Um, when it came time for me to start kindergarten, though, we moved back to where mom's family was. Dad was a Marine born in San... I, I was born in San Diego. Dad was born in Indianapolis, Indiana. Mom was born in Tupelo, Mississippi. So when it came time for me to start school, my parents decided that it would be best to be raised in my mother's side of the family for the most part. So we settled in the Tupelo area, North Mississippi, and that's essentially where I stayed for many, many years. I graduated high school up there. There was a brief stint, as you can see, in Asheville, North Carolina, but 
not really all that relevant, just kind of a hop, skip, and a jump to get to Mississippi. And there, there I stayed, raised in the humidity, the thunderstorms, the tornadoes, the spiders, the size of your face, that kind of stuff. And well, and also like six different species of venomous snakes. Those are fun. Some of them look just like regular snakes, so you gotta be really good at spotting them. Poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, we got all of it. And of course, the occasional hurricane that decides it wants to come up through the Gulf of Mexico. So that's where I'm comfortable, that's where I live. And then, you know, as, as uh, Cedric said, I got the degrees and moved to uh, here where it's very dry and there's not a lot of rain or thunder and tiny spiders. Sorry, your transients are tiny. Okay, and you have two species of venomous snakes and they both rattle, so you're like, oh good, I know that one won't, don't need to bite me. So, I'm here and I've been here since 2018, made the way, and this right here, so a little bit of uh, my hometown, this is actually my grandmother's house that has been there for as long as I can remember. My house, because we moved so much, there really wasn't a stable one for very long amounts of time. So I don't really have any pictures of my house that I kind of grew up in. This is, this is still what I, when I go home to Mississippi, this, this is kind of where I go. This is where I spent the holidays with my grandmother. Uh, my grandfather passed uh, several years ago, but Mama is still the matriarch of the family. This is where we have Christmas, this is where we all get together, those of us that still talk to each other, and that's kind of it. You can see some of our family's, you know, truck choices. This is one first cousin, that's my other first cousin. I only have the two first cousins um, on this side of the family. And my previous car, which if anyone's seen my newest car, I kind of, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a theme here. Um, and this, this is, yeah, this is where I grew up. This is where we had the Easter's. This is the green area. And if we want to get really specific, this is Fulton, Mississippi. So about 30 miles outside of Tupelo, where I grew up. This is uh, my family here uh, with my mother, who passed just a few years ago, my sister, uh, my first nephew. I now have two nephews. And my grandmother, we've kind of cut off Lily over there, the, uh, the pet of the family. Um, my father over here, uh, the, the ex-Marine, and his new wife, Joni, my stepmother. And then my grandfather, uh, back when he was still with us, and my aunt, who we don't talk to anymore. So, for the most part, you know, we're, we're all families. We all had families. We all have families. And we know that sometimes... We have our differences, and that is just as relevant here as it is anywhere else. But we grew up with a family, and they'll always be there for us. And this is kind of me in some of my younger years, all over the place, uh, some of the North Carolina stuff. Uh, this is Tupelo. This is kind of the house I grew up in. Some of the baby pictures, my grandmother, and that is Jason, one of my first cousins, and there's the uncle, his dad. Uh, mom and dad back when they were together. So one of the few things that has been kind of constant in my life, and they're both on here, is dogs. I am a dog person. Now, of course, there are two chihuahuas in the picture. Cricket, that one's mine. Cricket is my childhood dog. And we also had, not the picture, but boxers. We raised boxers for many, many, many years. So I do love me a good, super drooly, butt-wiggling boxer. Uh, any day of the week. That, that I love me some dogs now. Not to mean I'm not a cat person. There's just a preference. I prefer sausage over pepperoni on my pizza. Doesn't mean I don't like pizza. So I definitely raised with dogs, raised with animals. And then the other pretty constant thing in my life, which I'm going to touch on today, is National Power Rangers Day, um, which is why all of the flyers and stuff that you've seen around campus has the Green Ranger on it. It's on my car. It, Jason is definitely my Green Ranger, uh, White Ranger later, and of course I'm wearing the theme today as well. But because of things like Power Rangers, Ninja Turtles, and Mom's obsession with Jean-Claude Van Damme, I got into martial arts pretty stinking early. Uh, this is actually many years into martial arts from the first round. I was probably in it from the time I was seven or eight years old uh, with a style called Goju Ryu. 
and then moved over to uh, Schoen Room, which is what we're seeing here. That class eventually got canceled, and then I got into the adult Aikido and Shinkendo, um, eventually jumping around until, um, spoiler, not spoiler, I uh, eventually got my black belt just this past January in a form called Kempo, uh, which is taught here in the valley. So you'll hear me talk about that quite a bit. Now, when I got to high school, you know, elementary school, and you're still trying to figure things out. Obviously, the dog stuff stuck. Obviously, the martial arts stuff stuck with me, but the science stuff, the stuff that I would eventually come to kind of underlie the core parts of my personality wouldn't come until high school. And in high school, like a lot of families in the U.S., my parents got divorced when I was 13. And I went to live with my grandmother for a while, hence her picture up there. Lived with her for a while, and the first cousin that was not pictured gave me my first Star Wars books. Never read them before. I had read Animorphs, which for those of us old enough, these came out alongside Goosebumps. Goosebumps had a better publisher. Um, but Animorphs was my thing. And with Josh giving me those two Star Wars books right there, everything kind of changed. Uh, science, science fiction became an underlying feature to everything in my life. Now, if you're not familiar, everyone kind of knows what Star Wars is, but if you're not familiar with Animorphs, uh, essentially an alien crash lands on Earth and gives five kids, the four kids and another alien, the power to change. They can change into any animal they touch. And the reason he gave them that power was so that they could fight off an alien invasion of slugs that would go in your ear and take over people's bodies. So that's what kind of got me that even more cemented into the animal thing um, and the science fiction thing. By the time I got into my freshman year of high school, um, I don't know if this is more my parents or me, but they kind of forced me into, I don't want to say forced, that's the wrong word. I was encouraged heavily to get into, say, the gifted program. Um, so whether I was actually gifted or just told to be gifted, I strove, I struggled, I got there. Um, this is me meeting the senator of Mississippi because I was the first student in Morville High School's history to score a perfect score on the statewide algebra test. Uh, as an eighth grader, as an eighth grader. So this is my ninth grade year with the senator. I've got a big letter and stuff from him. And that kind of became it. I, I, I knew a path. I had a goal. I knew more of what I wanted to do. I wanted to be the veterinarian. And you can see me there with Morpheus, uh, leopard gecko. Uh, luckily, mom was okay with reptiles, dad. Not so much. He was always afraid the snake would get loose in the house. One time it did. Um, the geckos never got loose. But this was a big deal. And I was in our version of, we didn't call it Science Bowl, we called it Scholars Bowl. Uh, because it was English, it was history, it was science, it was math. Um, my emphasis was the science. So this, I found out what I was kind of good at. And everybody kind of had their thing. And when I graduated high school, um, I did not graduate valedictorian because of that guy right there. That guy right there. This was before they gave 5.0s on any course. There were no 5.0 GPAs back then. Uh, so when it came down to valedictorian, it was me and Mr. Martin Fancher, and he got like .001 above my GPA. That was the difference that separated us. So I got salutatorian, but you know, Things happen. At the end of the day, it's not that big of a deal. It's really not. It was at the time. I was furious and spitting matrix quotes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but looking back now, did it have any effect on what I did in college? No. Did it have any effect on who my friends were later in life? No. So the distinctions matter, especially if you want scholarships and stuff. But at the end of the day, who was first and who was second has no bearing on where I am right now. I put a lot of pressure on myself that didn't need to be there. It wasn't necessary, and unfortunately, that kind of mentality stuck with me. And anybody who's known me for a long amounts of time knows that I get very stressed at very little things that I want to control. I hear laughing from the peanut gallery. <laughs> 
because uh, those of you who know me, that's it. And it's it's because of this kind of competition right here. I know what I want. Always get the reaction. Um, a lot of them don't really understand what snakes and reptiles and those sorts of things are all about. Um, it really gives them the first chance to, to observe firsthand what it is. It was really interesting. I enjoyed getting to handle the snake, and everybody acts scared at first, but I thought it was something new to see. Dr. Morris takes center stage with his wildlife friends. That include the star of the show, the snake. His other attractions are a screech owl, which mainly hangs out somewhere in the classroom, a barred owl, leopard gecko, and bearded dragon. None of them have names. Dr. Morris and science teacher Peggy Husser want students to understand wildlife should not be pets. Today we're really concerned about teaching science by inquiry, so I think that um, this was a way of hands-on that they will learn a lot from. This was a very cool experience. I uh, hadn't done nothing like this before, never touched a snake before, and it was real cool. And it was a lot of fun. I, I was really nervous to hold the snake at first, but it was pretty cool. It felt weird. While the snake is fascinating, the story of both owls is actually more interesting. They were both hit by cars, the barred owl just one week ago. It remains partially blind, a condition the doctor hopes will improve. Husser says such lessons help students to respect wildlife and the environment. Reporting from Morville Middle School, I'm Susan Parker. It's the Oscars for Mississippi. So that was the veterinarian I worked for right after high school. Dr. Morris was an exotic vet and the only North Mississippi wildlife rehabilitator. I worked for him for two years with things like that. I've, I've neutered a guinea pig. I have euthanized an emu. I have removed the femoral head off of a 200 pound Rottweiler. These are things that I did. And yes, it's pretty cool stuff. I'm trying not to cuss. Um, that, would, you know, anybody would love, well, I can say anybody, some not so much with the blood gore, uh, but why did I not stick with that? I wanted to be a vet. I was there. Over those two years, while I was also taking classes at ICC, my first school was at Obama Community College. I went to a community college as well. 99% of what Dr. Morris did was just annual shots. Rabies vaccines, diphtheria, diphtheria, that kind of stuff. Just normal shots and spays and neuters on dogs and cats. Occasionally we did cool things, yes. We, we went out and did cool things, but was it enough? It wasn't, and Dr. Morris, as a mentor, saw that. Saw that I wasn't happy doing that. And there was one incident where a ferret was coming in during emergency hours. And I didn't initiate the stuff as a vet tech I should have. Get the, the lactator, uh, lactate reader solution out, getting the saline out, prepping it up. And it, it just kind of clicked at that moment. This wasn't the path for me. So as a mentor, Dr. Morris and I sat down. Do not underestimate mentors. They matter. And we sat down and realized that where I was happiest was when we went out and did those kinds of outreaches. The education portion was where I felt most comfortable. So I changed my major in community college. And here's the rub. Before I got out of high school, I had already been accepted into vet school. Before I even graduated high school, already in vet school, already had a spot lined up. Didn't matter. Plans change, lives change, people change. I changed. So I went to Ole Miss, which at the time, and as far as I know still is, one of the higher end education programs in the state of Mississippi. There were three paths, biology, chemistry, and physics. Those were the only education degrees you could get. So I went through biology. It was very closely related to what I had already been doing. To make ends meet, I worked at both Civilian and Best Buy. Best Buy is still pretty defining. I was still working at Best Buy when I moved here. 
Love me some retail, love me some Best Buy. It is just like one step to the side of education. But I got the degree in biology education. That, that, that was what they offered. It's like the February before I was supposed to graduate, my advisor calls me in and she's like, Mr. Nolan, you're gonna be one credit short to graduate. And I'm like, cuss. So what am I supposed to do? So we went through the list of courses that were offered over the summer. And there was a study abroad, I'm doing my air quotes because it wasn't really abroad, uh, study abroad in the Grand Canyon. Sure, why not? Sure, what happened there? Heard it's supposed to be pretty cool. Got there and everything changed again. Everything. Who gives a flying flip about biology now? I found fossils and dinosaurs. So I got there and like a whole world that had not been exposed to me was suddenly there. Rocks and fossils? Kind of cool when you're looking and holding the poop of a 250 million year old dinosaur. How is that not the coolest thing you've ever seen in your entire life? So I was lucky enough to get hired here. Right out of high school, right out of college, Germantown Middle School. And it's like all the stars align. They didn't give me a biology teaching job. They gave me earth and space science. Suddenly I'm teaching seventh graders astronomy, volcanoes, earthquakes. And I'm like, holy crap, this is kind of cool. And in the middle school, they still think it's kind of cool too. They're, they're, they're not, oh, so lame, or, you know, Mr. Nolan and his Finding Nemo references. They liked Finding Nemo. Still do. So I was able to do that for seven years, teaching Earth and Space Science and some STEM classes. But there came a time where I'm like, I want to raise it up a level. And I was also doing some Science Olympiad stuff. So Science Olympiad became a big, big deal. How do you get kids engaged in science outside of the science classroom? And that's what Science Olympiad was. So yes, we did labs in class. Yes, we did Science Olympiad. I was also a sponsor of the yearbook, so I'm pretty good around a camera too, behind the camera. Hated being in front of it. My acne didn't go away until after I was nearly 30. That was pretty rough, pretty rough. So this became a big deal. Getting science outside into the real world with Science Olympiad. Did that for all seven years, and I'm like, I want to run this. I want to help everybody in the state with this. So at the time, after I got done with all of my teaching, so up here you can see some of my teacher friends. Obviously, I'm not the hugger, but they are. This is me after one of my students contracted cancer. Rhabdomyosarcoma, stage four. Little, I've got to bring you down a little bit before I can bring you up. So once, the summer after I taught this student, I get an email from his dad saying that for the first time ever, he, was in, he liked the sciences. And it wasn't about how I taught the science. Had nothing to do with how I taught the science. It was because he wore a Green Day shirt and I could make Green Day references. It was a personal connection that allowed him to become engaged with the material in a way he had never thought about it before. And then the next summer I get a different email. He was at Disney World with a stomach pain, went to the doctor, and had already gotten to stage four. So I went and visited him a few months before he passed. No talk about science, nothing like that. We sat for hours and talked about Lost, the TV series. Lost. I had never seen a single episode, but I could hold myself with a science fiction conversation. 
hours and hours of Lost and a little bit of Halo. Still haven't played Halo. I'm not an Xbox person. But his mom and dad after that day, there's so many ways to change a student's life. So many ways to make a connection and some of which you'll never imagine before. So that's why I'm in education. That's why I'm a science teacher. Not just a scientist. Yes, I can do the research, but I see myself first and foremost as a science teacher. It's for moments like this that you never know show up. Never know show up. Okay. Obligatory picture of my dog back in the day. Her name was Lupa. This was us doing a little afternoon walk. Um, the train did show up a little bit later and we had to jump, but it was fine. So when it came time for me to move on and help run Science Olympiad, I went to Southern Miss. While I was teaching, I went ahead and got a second degree while I was teaching in the geosciences. Earth and space, still my thing. Went into science education at Southern Miss. Got my PhD, helped run Science Olympiad. And that kind of got me here. That kind of got me here. So I moved here and asked if I could be part of Colorado Science Olympiad. Sure, why not? And then the guy that runs it, basically stepped out the year after I got here and said, does anyone want to help run it? And I'm like, I can do that. So for the last five years, I've also been the Colorado Science Olympiad president. While I was in grad school though, despite the earth and space science courses, this was my favorite class. Also, here's the thing, your favorite class doesn't have to be your best grade. I made a C in this class. Made a C in this class. Could not care less. Had a blast. Had a blast. Queen snake, yellow uh, bellied uh, water snake. I got there. This was the field part of it where you put fish traps out. And these uh, fish eaters, these fish eaters here, will go into the fish trap and get stuck just like the fish. So the first day we go out to check the traps, we're all in a big group. You can see Joseph back there. We're all in this big group, and the instructor opens up the fish trap and asks, who wants to grab it? Well, I'm one of the older ones there because I'm a grad student, and these are undergrads. So I'm like, let the young ones go first. Let them get the experience. But guess what? Guess who raised their hand? Not a single one. So I'm like, I do it. So I went over there and grabbed it. And guess what that little bugger did? It bit me. It bit me. But guess what you can't do in front of a bunch of youngins? You can't freak out. You can't freak out. Okay? Because if you freak out, what are they going to do? They're going to freak out too. They're going to freak out too. Bit me, had a little ring, you know, a little half, a semicircle mark of where, because they have tiny itty bitty little teeth. No thanks. I knew it wasn't venomous. Because that's what we're, that's the whole point of what we're learning, right? Bit me, fine. Bit it. And then of course, then everybody else starts grabbing it. Then everybody else starts grabbing it. This is something I teach when I teach um, new teachers as well. So you know we have the tarantula fest here. When I was teaching the teachers, these elementary teachers, future elementary teachers, I'm like, go touch a tarantula. Because you're not allowed to give your fear to the students. Not allowed to do that. If you do that, you have already blocked off all of your students' potential. Can't do that. Go touch them. Give your students the opportunity. Okay, then we started moving. Got the job here at La Hunta, packed up the car, packed up the U-Haul, on my way. Here we go, 2018 summer, 115 degrees Fahrenheit the day I got here. You gotta be kidding me, okay? But here's the thing, here's the thing. It's a dry heat. It still feels hotter in Mississippi, I'm sorry. Okay, 95 in Mississippi with an 85 degree humidity. I'm sorry, it still feels worse over there. I'm like, oh, this is bad. Okay, of course, with my pasty ass skin, I have to put on like 25 sunscreen layers and be fine that way. But I got here. Dad helped me move in. Okay, so favorite books. Um, and of course, the, when I moved here, I, I'm like, I've got to have a two bedroom apartment because I need a library. I have a thousand plus books. 
They are in my second bedroom where I have my little office during COVID, did all of that, because I want my books visible. I, I want to be able to pass them down later when that comes up. I'm not one of those that think, I'm not going to, oh Lord, I'm not going to turn them backwards, okay? I'm not going to color code them, okay? I want my books visible, and I want them alphabetical and chronological, Okay, I'm sorry, that's how you do books. Sorry, Marie Kondo fans. I'm not gonna do that, okay? Uh, but all of them there, all of them visible. I want, I want to be able to see it. I want to be immersed in it. Immersed, immersed in it. There we go, got the word. Immersed in it. I want that to be it. So books, yeah. Movies, again, oh, where's my last one? Maybe it takes a little bit. That should be Terminator 2, I think. Okay, obviously a sci-fi fan. Obviously a sci-fi fan. Pretty sure that's going to be Terminator 2 if it decides to show up. Okay, Aliens and Terminator 2, you'll notice, are sequels. Okay, generally considered better than the originals and both by James Cameron. Okay, I'm a huge James Cameron fan. I love The Abyss, all that kind of stuff, but I have two for. Okay, Contact. Of course, uh, Mr. Corbett's here. Uh, loves this movie. It is a great movie as well. And then... I have toothlesses all over my apartment. I love me some toothless, and I fear for the live action they're about to make on it. I know, I know those three are like the perfect trilogy outside of, you know, the trilogies. Uh, Lord of the Rings, the original Star Wars, stuff like that. So my favorite movies, I, I'm so sad that Terminator 2 didn't show up. But this is also something I kind of want to mention. The main character here, the main character here and the main character in Terminator 2 are what? They're all women. And I made this connection kind of later in life, and I'm not going to try to mansplain anything here, but I grew up with my mother in the sci-fi being women strong. And I also want to think that that kind of aligned with all of the other stuff that's kind of in the background there. I try to live my life thinking that anybody can be an Ellen Ripley, that anybody can be a Sarah Connor. It doesn't have to be men only. It doesn't have to be white men only. It doesn't have to be cis straight white men only. That's how I also try to teach my classes, that the potential is for everyone. And I grew up with those strong female presences every day. And then we get to Buffy as well, so can't not talk about Buffy. So my TV shows, okay, uh, Stargate, that's my other wrist. So this I grew up on, uh, Stargate, all 15 seasons of it, uh, no, 17 seasons of it. Uh, and I think we all kind of know what Avatar The Last Airbender is at this point. Buffy the Vampire Slayer with Sarah Michelle Gellar as the titular Buffy, and House, which of course is based on a Sherlock Holmes, but a much more unlikable character, but I even went as house during some Halloween while I was teaching middle school. Got the cane and did the whole limp thing. Wasn't the first time. Now you'll notice there is no Big Bang Theory up here, despite the fact that even my father calls me Sheldon. <laughs> I have the posters. They were in my middle school classroom as well. The students made the connection. I have some quirks. I have some quirks. But these are defining sci-fi fantasy, and with Avatar The Last Airbender, that aligns very closely with my philosophy on the martial arts. That martial arts are more about, are more than just about kicking butt and taking names. That's not what it's about at all. There is a core philosophy underlying all martial arts that is beyond the ability of just hitting things and making them bleed. That's not what we're about at all. Music, I changed my format a little bit so I can stick more up here. Music all over the place. Years and years in the UK, uh, Eminem, Shine Out, some pretty hard stuff, but then we get some of the lighter CCR, uh, Love Me Some Tenacious D, funny stuff. Uh, Shania Twain got there a little bit, about the only country I can really do, and some Garth Brooks, sorry. Um, but then you give me some show tunes and I'm fine. The one I want to talk about is the Eminem show. There are some of you who may define yourselves with music or with movies, with a book, something like that. That album, The Eminem Show, was another life-changing moment for me. I saw Eminem live, not in person, but on a Grammys 
singing, cleaning out my closet, which is on that album. And he also did White America on that album. And I'm like, holy bleepity bleepity bleep. If you've ever heard of him, you know what I'm talking about. It was amazing what I heard. It was, I don't know how to explain how life all treat that album is. For me, it spoke to me about, because I didn't really cover it, but it spoke to me about how you don't have to like your family. Because there were things in the past that I didn't really talk about that made me want to seek out a found family. Not every, I mean, we, I did mention, you know, we're not talking to some of the people, but there's more than that, deeper than that. And Eminem, at the time, because this was undergrad, I think, 2002, 3, 4, something like that, and I'm like, I can think that way? That's an option? And this is the album where he finally had enough money where he didn't have to necessarily sing to the producers. He could sing whatever he wanted, and he had some messages he wanted to say. And still one of those I'll listen to the album through and through several times. I mean, I'll do that with pretty much any of them up there, but that one was kind of a life-defining moment for me. When it comes to hobbies, just, you know, spare time, if I'm not watching TV, movies, or reading, these are kind of the, some of the few things that I do like to do. Um, so Pokemon Go, I'm also playing Scarlet Violet, got the DLC ready to go. Um, I was, as a millennial, Gen 1 came out when I was in middle school. So I lost touch because for a while there was not cool. And it's kind of come back into the mainstream. So I do Pokemon Go. I don't do the card game or anything like that. But I do uh, play the console games. Um, same with Link. I didn't really get into any Legend of Zelda stuff until the Switch. So Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Those are my Links um, and my Zeldas. And geocaching. I don't know what to say with that, say to this without being too hurtful. Um, geocaching here in southeastern Colorado, not great. Uh, I like the caches, if you're familiar with it, it's basically using a GPS to go find Tupperware in the woods. That's a cliche version of it, but that's what it is. And in Mississippi, I'd be walking along these green nature paths, surrounded by trees and spiders and snakes, for like three miles to get to it. And then I found it, and then I come back. But here, unfortunately, it's flat, it's a desert, and we don't really have those kinds of paths here. So I really feel like I haven't done my geocaching potential in Colorado yet. Um, I'm really hoping that maybe, put this on the record over there, um, that I might be able to start putting some fancy ones on campus. I would like to really do some good, high-end, not tiny nano micro caches on campus. But that's kind of a plan of mine that I like. Uh, electric vehicles, okay? In 2007, when I started teaching middle school, I was looking through the book, and suddenly there's this little red car on the bottom of one of these pages that the EV1, as shown in Who Killed the Electric Car? I'm like, what the heck is an electric car? It's Mississippi. We don't do electric cars, especially in 2007. I watched it. Another life-changing moment. Holy crap, another life-changing moment. I'm like, why do I not have an electric car? They were there, they got made, and then GM killed it. By 2012, I owned an electric car, Nissan Leaf. First one in Mississippi. First one in Mississippi. Um, when I moved to Hattiesburg at Southern Miss, I had to give it up because it only had like an 80 mile range and it's 100 and something miles to get to Hattiesburg. But then I got here, started making a little bit more money, saved up over years and years and years, and traded in my Subaru for my second electric car. That green Tesla out there with the dragon sword symbol, that one's mine, okay? Kind of a life goal there that I've been striving for for years and years and years, and I will talk to anyone about the pros and cons and the verses of EVs versus plug-in uh, hybrids versus pure gas guzzlers like white hummers. And then we, <laughs> uh, and then we have my black belt that I got in January. Because life got in the way, I got a third. When I was 13, I got a junior black belt in show and room. But then life, and moving, and bills, and things just got in the way, and I jumped from style to style to style, and never made it. 
got here, one of the instructors here was doing some martial arts kind of on the off time, and it has been stable enough here that I've called Southeastern Colorado my home that I have finally achieved my adult black belt. My adult black belt. And for anyone who wants to learn martial arts, we do have the dojo right down the streets. Okay? I will be happy to answer any questions and we make it as low pressure as possible. If you just want to try it out, we've got you covered. Now, how to put this in there. Uh, as far as sci-fi goes, Star Wars versus Star Trek, I don't care. To me, they are two different things. If we want to get real, I'm going to make some people very angry real quick. This is fantasy. This is science fiction. Star Wars is fantasy. They explain nothing of the science. No idea of how hyperdrives work or lightsabers or the force. It's fantasy, and I'm fine with that. I'll put it in the same category. I know I'm going to make more people angry as Lord of the Rings. Star Trek, if you want to see the future, that's where you go. Do you know we didn't have automatic doors until after Star Trek? People didn't think that was even possible, and then we made it possible. Tricorders, those are coming. Hitchhiker's uh, uh, Guide, Babble Fish, uh, Universal Translators, we have those on all of our phones now. Star Trek predicts the future. Star Wars is an escape from reality. I'm sorry, but both of them live in an equal spot in my heart. I am not discounting either one of them. I am not. I, I rewatched the sequel trilogy, I know, last night. Okay? I know. I know. It's not the greatest, but I rewatched it because Ahsoka is the greatest Star Wars character ever made, period. I'm going to put my foot down and die on that hill. No, no. Sith Jar Jar, maybe. But Jar Jar Binks, no, not so much. Okay, and this is where I'll leave you. It is a Star Wars quote, so there you go. Pass on what you have learned, strength, mastery, but weakness. Folly, failure, also. Failure most of all, because the greatest teacher, failure is. As far as teaching goes, we are what they grow beyond. The true burden of all masters. We are not here to hold you back as students. We are here to push you beyond what we could ever have imagined for ourselves. And I hope that message has come across today. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, we have a question. Uh, yes, we will be posting this on YouTube as well, okay. but I can email you the slides if you need me. Yep. Okay, sure. Yeah, just leave it with Miss Sherry and I'll get it sent out to you. Okay? Yes, ma'am. How do you sign up for the geo thing? Geocaching? No. no. Oh, uh, uh, see me after class. When this is done, I'll give you a little flyer and some business cards. Yep. Okay. Where was your middle school that you taught at? Because I looked it up online. Oh, school. it's actually the school I graduated from. So it was a K-12 school. Uh, oh, Germantown. Um, that is in now Gluckstadt, Mississippi. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's German. It's German origin, so Gluckstadt. Um, if you look up Madison, Mississippi, you'll get there. Yeah, so Germantown sure. Middle School, Madison, Mississippi. But it, to be really persnickety about it, it's Gluckstadt, Mississippi. Very German. Any other questions? How do you become obsessed with something? How do you become obsessed with something? I would say that depends on how your brain is wired. Um, sometimes, if we really want to use the word obsessed, I would say that's a coping mechanism because most of that obsession of mine came when my parents got divorced and I was living with my grandmother. So that was my escapism. That was me trying to compensate for no longer having mom around, no longer having dad around, not having my dogs around, the two boxers were not with us. So that became my dive into that and that's probably, I don't have any psych people here, I don't think. Um, I don't know if that's a healthy or an unhealthy obsession, but there it is. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I'm glad you're all here today. Make sure you sign the sheets. I will not be here tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs>